Hello and welcome to Bar 10, Lesson 61, where we help you prepare for the bar exam 10 questions at a time. We focus on 10 MBE questions with full analysis and explanations. Let's get right into it. Question number one. Alice entered into a contract with Paul, by the terms of which Paul was to paint Alice's office for $1,000 and was required to do all of the work over the following weekend so as to avoid disruption of Alice's business. For this question only, assume the following facts. If Paul had started to paint on the following Saturday morning, he could have finished before Sunday evening. However, he stayed home that Saturday morning to watch the final game of the World Series on TV and did not start to paint until Saturday afternoon. By late Saturday afternoon, Paul realized that he had underestimated the time it would take to finish the job if he continued to work alone. Paul phoned Alice at her home and accurately informed her that it was impossible to finish the work over the weekend unless he hired a helper. He also stated that to do so would require an additional charge of $200 for the work. Alice told Paul that she apparently had no choice but to pay whatever it takes to get the work done as scheduled. Paul hired Ted to help finish the painting and paid Ted the $200. Alice has offered to pay Paul $1,000. Paul is demanding $1,200. How much is Paul likely to recover? Let's look at our four options. Option A, $1,000 only, because Alice received no consideration for her promise to pay the additional sum. B, $1,000 only, because Alice has promised to pay whatever it takes is too uncertain to be enforceable. C, $1,200 in order to prevent Alice's unjust enrichment. D, $1,200 because the impossibility of Paul's completing the work alone discharged the original contract and a new contract was formed. Take a few seconds and choose what you think is the best option now. I hope you chose option one. That would be the only correct answer here. $1,000 only because Alice received no consideration for her promise to pay the additional sum. Consideration, remember, is the bargain for exchange between parties. Consideration is present anytime promises with value or performances are exchanged. Any legal detriment or forbearance, as well as actual benefits and performance, can constitute consideration. Taking an action that a person was already legally obligated to do is not new consideration. The legal detriment or forbearance must be new to be valid consideration unless it is an addition or change in the performance. An unforeseen difficulty or a third party promise to pay. Here, Paul promised to paint Alice's office over the weekend in exchange for the $1,000 we mentioned before. Paul phoned Alice late Saturday afternoon to inform her that he could not finish the work over the weekend unless he hired a helper for an additional charge of $200. The reason Paul could not finish is because he chose to stay home and watch TV instead of starting on time. Paul was asking for more money in exchange for doing the same work he had already promised to do. This means Alice's promise to pay the additional $200 was not supported by any valid consideration. As such, Paul will likely recover the $1,000 only because Alice received no consideration for her promise to pay the additional sum. Let's look at the other three choices and analyze why we think they're incorrect. Option B, $1,000 only because Alice has promised to pay whatever it takes is too uncertain to be enforceable. Well, let's analyze this point in relation to the question. While Alice's response was whatever it takes, she was very clear that what was being demanded was $200. So she conceded to the $200. So arguably, this whatever it takes being uncertain or too uncertain to be enforceable is inappropriate because we understand what the whatever it takes is. It's 200 extra dollars. That's what it takes. C, $1,200 in order to prevent Alice's unjust enrichment. I'm not sure how Alice would be unjustly enriched uh, by paying the $1,000 as opposed to the $1,200. Maybe the assumption here is that she'd get more value 
when in fact she's not getting more value, she's getting exactly what she initially contractually bargained for. So C would be inappropriate because there's no unjust enrichment in receiving exactly what you bargained for for the price that you bargained it for. D, $1,200 because the impossibility of Paul's completing the work alone discharged the original contract and a new contract was formed. Well, the issue here, as we heard in the explanation as to option A and why option A is correct, the impossibility was simply created by the late start by the hired contractor, Paul. So as a result, the impossibility was self-created. If he had started on time, the job would not have been impossible. So that being said, it's his own fault. He takes the onus, it falls back on him. Had he started on time, he would have been able to complete the job. It was his choice. Why should Alice have to pay for that? Question number two, House owns his home in city. On the lawn in front of his home and within five feet of the public sidewalk, there was a large tree. The roots of the tree caused the sidewalks to buckle severely and become dangerous. An ordinance of city requires adjacent landowners to keep sidewalks in safe condition. House engaged contractor to repair the damaged sidewalk, leaving it to contractor to decide how the repair should be made contractor dug up the sidewalk cut back the roots of the tree and laid a new sidewalk two days after house had paid contractor the agreed price of the repair the tree fell over onto the street and damaged a parked car belonging to driver driver has asserted a claim against house and contractor and both defendants admit that cutting the roots caused the tree to fall the theory on which driver is most likely to prevail against House is that House is A. Strictly liable because the tree was on his property. B. Liable for contractor's negligence if, to House's knowledge, contractor was engaged in hazardous activity. C. Liable because he assumed responsibility when he paid contractor for the repair. Or D. Liable on the basis of respondeat superior. Take a few seconds and choose what you think is the best option as an answer now. I hope you chose option B. That's the right answer. Liable for contractor's negligence if, to House's knowledge, contractor was engaged in hazardous activity. Remember that vicarious liability is based on relationships between the parties. The general rule is that one who hires an independent contractor is not generally liable for the torts of that independent contractor. However, one who hires an independent contractor is liable for the contractor's torts when the contractor is engaged in inherently dangerous activities. In this case, contractor had decided how to go about repairing the sidewalk in front of House's house. Generally, House would not be liable for contractor's torts stemming from this repair. However, if House knew contractor was engaged in an inherently dangerous activity while repairing the sidewalk, then House would be liable for contractor's torts stemming from the repair. Thus, the theory on which driver is most likely to prevail against House is that House is liable for contractor's negligence if, to House's knowledge, contractor was engaged in a hazardous activity. Let's take a look at the other three answers and see why they're incorrect. Let's start analyzing these inversely. Let's look at D, liable on the basis of respondeat superior. In our analysis of option B, we've already discussed that generally there is no respondeat superior liability when hiring an independent contractor unless, the unless is the huge part, unless it's an inherently dangerous activity. So D is eliminated. C, liable because he assumed responsibility when he paid contractor for the repair. In essence, C is less of a relationship between the parties than D because it's only stating that there was a payment, right? That doesn't necessarily include any contractual agreement, any hiring. It could simply be that the individual being paid is an agent of someone else or a third party. That being said, C is relatively unclear as to what the relationship between the parties is. So C should be eliminated right off the bat. 
A, strictly liable because the tree was on his property. Here, we're clear that strict liability should not apply because both defendants have acknowledged that the cutting of the roots actually, in fact, caused the tree to fall. There is no question of what caused the damage, so strict liability should not apply. Let's move on to question number three, and let's make it three for three here. House owns his home in city on the lawn in front of his home, and within five feet of the public sidewalk, there was a large tree. The roots of the tree caused the sidewalk to buckle severely and become dangerous. An ordinance of city requires adjacent landowners to keep sidewalks in safe condition. House engaged contractor to repair the sidewalk, leaving it to contractor to decide how the repair should be made. Contractor dug up the sidewalk, cut back the roots of the tree, and laid a new sidewalk. Two days after House had paid contractor the agreed price of the repair, the tree fell over onto the street and damaged a parked car belonging to Driver. Driver has asserted a claim against House and contractor, and both defendants admit that cutting the roots caused the tree to fall. If the claim of Driver against contractor, the best defense of the contractor is that A. The tree was on the property of House. B, he repaired the sidewalk at the direction of house. C, he could not reasonably foresee that the tree would fall. Or D, he was relieved of liability when house paid for the repair. Take a few seconds and choose the best answer now. You should have selected option C. You should be three for three right now. C, he could not reasonably foresee that the tree would fall. Remember that to establish a prima facie case of negligence, the plaintiff has to show duty, a breach of that duty, causation, and damages. The duty of care is a legal duty requiring the defendant to act according to a certain standard to protect the plaintiff against an unreasonable risk of injury. A duty of care is owed to all foreseeable plaintiffs and the extent of the duty is determined by the applicable standard of care. The basic standard of care is that of a reasonable person of ordinary prudence in the defendant's position. In this case, driver would assert a claim under a negligence theory against contractor. One way contractor could have breached his duty of care to driver is if he... Re- If a reasonable person of ordinary prudence in contractor's position could have reasonably foreseen that the tree would fall after having its roots cut back. Contractor's defense that he could not reasonably foresee that the tree would fall is not likely a defense that could prevail against driver, but it is the best defense among the answer options available. Therefore, C is the best answer. A, in and of itself, the tree was on the property of house is not a very valid defense, especially if... Uh, He was the individual correcting or fixing that property and uh, addressing the issues with the tree. So given the fact that uh, the contractor was actually working on the tree, the fact that the tree was on the property of house would not relieve him from liability. B, he repaired the sidewalk at the direction of house, again, would not relieve him from liability because he himself was the person who engaged in those repairs and those repairs were that which caused the tree to fall. D. He was relieved of liability when House paid for the repair. If only things were that easy. Not at all. The fact that he was hired as a contractor or hired as an individual means nothing with regards to his liability. He himself engaged in the action which caused the tree to fall The inverse, however, may be true. Remember, if there was a contractor type of relationship, House may arguably be protected in having hired this contractor so long as he wasn't aware that this was an inherently dangerous activity. And usually repairing a sidewalk is not an inherently dangerous activity. So generally D would be applicable, but more so towards the homeowner as opposed to the contractor. Okay, let's keep this streak alive. Question number four. House owns his home in city 
on the lawn in front of his home and within five feet of the public sidewalk, there was a large tree. The roots of the tree caused the sidewalk to buckle severely and become dangerous. An ordinance of city requires adjacent landowners to keep sidewalks in safe condition. House engaged contractor to repair the sidewalk, leaving it to contractor to decide how the repair should be made. Contractor dug up the sidewalk, cut back the roots of the tree, and laid a new sidewalk. Two days after House had paid contractor the agreed price of the repair, the tree fell over onto the street and damaged a parked car belonging to Driver. Driver has asserted claims against House and contractor, and both defendants admit that cutting the roots caused the tree to fall. If Driver recovers a judgment against House, does House have any recourse against contractor? A. No, if payment by House was an acceptance of the work. B. No, because House selected contractor to do the work. C. Yes, if the judgment against House was based on vicarious liability. Or D. Yes, because House's conduct was not a factual cause of the harm. Take a few seconds and choose what you think is the best option as an answer now. The best option is option C, yes, if the judgment against House was based on vicarious liability. Vicarious liability is based on relationships between the parties. If an employee commits a tort in the scope of their employment, the employer will be vicariously liable. Indemnity is the shifting of liability from one defendant to the other, as opposed to sharing as as in contribution. If A is vicariously liable for B's conduct, B will be required to fully indemnify A. In this case, if House is vicariously liable for contractor's conduct, contractor will be required to fully indemnify House. As such, House would have recourse against contractor if the judgment against House was based on vicarious liability. Let's look at the three other options and see why they're not as correct. Option A, no if payment by House was an acceptance of the work. Meaningless. Option A should be eliminated right off the bat. Just because there was a payment and an acceptance of the work, the homeowner is not a professional. They're not able to be clear as to whether there is any damage or any harm or whether there could be any harm as a result of the contractor's work. As a result, A would not be an appropriate answer. B, no, because how selected contractor to do the work? Irrelevant. He chose this person. He, again, he is not a contractor himself. He chose this person because they were a professional and they were going to do the work. So as a result, A and B should both be eliminated for the same reason. Let's take a look at D. Yes, because House's conduct was not a factual cause of the harm. While D may be correct, it does not rise to the level of C, which clearly states that yes, There should be a recovery if there is vicarious liability found. So as a result, C is without question a better answer. Okay, we're coming on the halfway mark. Question number five. Dooley was a pitcher for the City Robins, a professional baseball team. While Dooley was throwing warm-up pitches on the sidelines during a game, he was continuously heckled by some spectators seated in the stands above the dugout behind a wire mesh fence. On several occasions, Dooley turned and looked directly at the hecklers with a scowl on his face, but the heckling continued. Dooley wound up as though he was preparing to pitch in the direction of his catcher. However, the ball traveled from his hand at a high speed, at a 90-degree angle from the line to the catcher and directly towards the hecklers in the stands. The ball passed through the wire mesh fence and struck Patricia, one of the hecklers. Patricia bought an action for damages against Dooley, and the City Robins, based on negligence and battery. The trial court directed a verdict for the defendants on the battery claim. The jury found for the defendants on the negligence count because the jury determined that Dooley could not foresee that the ball would pass through the wire mesh fence. Patricia has appealed the judgment on the battery counts, contending that the trial court erred in directing verdicts for Dooley and the City Robins. On appeal, the judgment entered on the directed verdict in Dooley's favor, on the battery claim should be a affirmed because the jury found on the evidence that Dooley could not foresee that the ball would pass through the fence. 
B. Affirmed if there was evidence that Dooley was mentally ill and that his act was the product of his mental illness. C. Reversed and the case remanded if a jury could find on the evidence that Dooley intended to cause the hecklers to be fear of being hit. Or D. Reversed and the case remanded because a jury could find that Dooley's conduct was extreme and outrageous and the cause of physical harm to Patricia. Take a few seconds and choose the very best answer here now. I hope you chose option C, reversed in the case remanded, if a jury could find on the evidence that Dooley intended to cause the hecklers to fear being hit. Battery is the intentional affliction of a harmful or offensive contact with victim's person. Assault in the, is the intentional creation of a reasonable apprehension of imminent harmful or offensive contact. Intent can be specific or general. Intent to commit a specific tort against a specific person is transferred to the tort actually committed or to the person actually harmed. Transferred intent is limited to assault, battery, false imprisonment, trespass to chattels, and trespass to land. Here, Dooley may have had the intent to cause the hecklers to be apprehensive about getting hit by the bull when he threw the bull directly at the hecklers. If so, then Dooley had the intent to commit assault. The bull actually, in fact, did hit Patricia, so Dooley's intent to commit assault against the hecklers can be transferred to the battery actually committed against Patricia. Thus, the judgment entered on the directed verdict in Dooley's favor on the battery claim should be reversed and the case remanded if a jury could find on the evidence that Dooley intended to cause the hecklers to fear being hit. Let's take a look at the three other options and see why they're not as correct. So now, option A is a bit difficult and a bit convoluted. Remember, this is an appeal, so we're looking at errors of law. Uh, A states affirm because the jury found on the evidence that Dooley could not foresee that the bull would pass through the fence. That is a question of fact. The appellate court shouldn't be addressing questions of fact, so A should not be an appropriate answer and should be eliminated. B. Affirmed if there was evidence that Dooley was mentally ill and that his act was the product of his mental illness. Let's go back to the same logic we just used. These are questions of fact, not questions of law. So should the appellate court be looking at these issues? Finally, option D, reversed and the case remanded because a jury could find that Dooley's conduct was extreme and outrageous and the cause of physical harm to Patricia. Question D doesn't quote the proper standard. We're looking at an intentional situation and a transfer of that intent. As a result, C is without question the best answer because A, B, and D simply don't apply. Question number six, until 1954, the state of New Atlantic required segregation in all public and private schools, but all public schools are now desegregated. Other state laws enacted before 1954 and continuing to present provide for free distribution of the same textbooks on secular subjects to students in all public and private schools. In addition, the state accredits schools and certifies teachers. Little White School, a private school that offers elementary and secondary education in the state, denies admission to all non-Caucasians. Stone School is a private school that offers religious instruction. Which of the following is the strongest argument in favor of the constitutionality of free distribution of textbooks to the students at Stone School? A. Private religious schools, like public non-sectarian schools, fulfill an important educational function. B. Religious instruction in private schools is not constitutionally objectionable. C. The purpose and effect of the free distribution of textbooks is secular and does not entangle church and state. D. The free exercise clause requires identical treatment by the state of students in public and private schools. Take a few seconds and choose what you believe to be the best answer now.
The best option here is option C. The purpose and effect of the free distribution of these textbooks is secular and does not entangle church and state. The overall purpose of the Establishment Clause in the First Amendment is to maintain a separation between church and state. In order for government action to be valid, it must have a secular purpose, a non-religious primary effect, and the action cannot foster excessive government entanglement with religion. Here, New Atlantic Law provides for the free distribution of the same textbooks on secular subjects to students in all public and private schools. The purpose and effect of providing these secular textbooks to all public and private schools is to provide education, not to advance or inhibit religion in any way, shape, or form. Providing these secular textbooks to Stone School will not foster excessive government entanglement with Stone School's religious instruction or activities. New Atlantic's action is likely, as a result, valid. Therefore, the strongest argument in favor of the constitutionality of the free distribution of the textbooks to the students at Stone School is that the purpose and effect of the free distribution of these textbooks is secular and does not entangle church and state. Let's look at the other three options very quickly because they're clearly incorrect. A. Private religious schools, like public non-sectarian schools, fulfill an important educational function. Irrelevant. Remember, we're talking about the Establishment Clause. Here is, so long as it is a secular duty that's being performed, or a secular act. B. Religious instruction in private schools is not constitutionally objectionable. Irrelevant. We're talking about whether this is a, a secular act or not. D. The Free Exercise Clause requires identical treatment by the state of students in public and private schools. D. Irrelevant again. We're looking at the act itself. Is the act a secular act or is it not? The act here is clearly secular because the language in and of itself explains that it only, the state only distributes secular textbooks. So as a result, C is the only correct possible answer. Question number seven. Stir up a rancher and Equinox, a fancier of horses, sign the following writing. For $5,000, Stir up will sell to Equinox a gray horse that Equinox may choose from among the grays on Stir up's ranch. Equinox refused to accept delivery of a gray horse timely tendered by Stir up or to choose among those remaining on the ground that during their negotiation, Stir up had orally agreed to include a saddle worth $100, and also to give Equinox the option to choose a gray or a brown horse. Equinox insisted on one of Stirrup's brown horses, but Stirrup refused to part with any of his browns or with the saddle as demanded by Equinox. If Equinox sues Stirrup for damages and seeks to introduce evidence of the alleged oral agreement, the court probably will A. Admit the evidence as to both the saddle and the option to choose a brown horse. B. Admit the evidence as to the saddle, but not the option to choose a brown horse. C. Admit the evidence as to the option to choose a brown horse, but not the promise to include the saddle. Or D. Not admit any of the evidence. Take a few seconds and choose what you believe is the right answer now. If you chose option B, you'd be correct. Admit the evidence as to the saddle, but not the option to choose a brown horse. Remember that the parole evidence rule states that no prior expressions, written or oral, or contemporaneous oral statements are admissible to contradict the final integration between the parties. For the parole evidence rule to apply, there must be an integration, i.e. a written agreement that intended to be the final contract between the parties. Integration can be complete or partial. Neither complete nor partial integrations can be contradicted by extrinsic evidence. Only a partial integration can be supplemented by offering evidence of consistent additional terms to explain an ambiguity in the written contract. Here, the written agreement between Stirrup and Equinox is likely a partially integrated agreement because it is a single simple sentence lacking the formalities of a typical complete integration. The partial integration did not cover saddles, so it can be supplemented with evidence of the saddles inclusion as a consistent additional term. However, the partial integration 
did cover the color of the horse by twice specifying the color gray. So evidence of the option to choose a brown horse would be contradicting the partial integration. Thus, the court will probably admit the evidence as to the saddle, but not the option to choose a brown horse. Let's very quickly look at the three other options and discuss why they're incorrect. Option A, admit the evidence as to both the saddle and the option to choose a brown horse. We're clear that the option to choose the brown horse would not be let in simply because the contract itself addressed those terms. C, admit the evidence as to the option to choose a brown horse. Analysis ends there. We know that's out. D, not admit any of the evidence. Now, that might be a, a possible answer that you mull over or that you consider, but you'd eliminate it once you note that the saddle, again, was not included in the discussion of the contract. So, including the saddle subsequently might be, or discussing the saddle subsequently, might simply be a clarification of the initial writing. So, the, given the fact that it was not included in the initial writing, it is up for consideration and up for discussion now. So, as a result, B is the correct answer, and B should have been your choice. Question number eight. In 1960, Omar, the owner of Fee Simple Absolute, conveyed Stoneacre, a five-acre tract of land. The relevant operative words of the deed conveyed to church, a duly organized religious body, having power to hold property for the life of my son, Carl, and from and after the death of my son, Carl, to all of my grandchildren and their heirs and assigns in equal shares, provided church shall use the premises for church purposes only. In, a, in an existing building on Stoneacre, church immediately began to conduct religious services and other activities normally associated with a church. In 1975, church granted to Darren a right to remove sand and gravel from a one-half-acre portion of Stoneacre upon the payment of, of royalty. Darren has regularly re removed sand and gravel since 1975 and paid this royalty to church. Church has continued to conduct religious services and other church activities on Stoneacre. All four of the living grandchildren of Omar joined by a guardian ad litem to represent unborn grandchildren, instituted suit against Church and Darren seeking damages for the removal of sand and gravel and an injunction preventing further acts of removal. There is no applicable statute. Which of the following best describes the likely disposition of this lawsuit? Let's look at the four options. Option A, the plaintiffs should succeed because the interests of Church terminated with the first removal of sand and gravel. B. Church and Darren should be enjoined, and damages should be recovered, but impounded for future distribution. C. The injunction should be granted, but damages should be denied, because Omar and Carl are not parties to the action. Or D. Damages should be awarded, but the injunction should be denied. Take a few seconds and think it through. Choose what you think is the best answer now. The correct answer here is B. Church and Darren should be enjoined, and damages should be recovered, but impounded for future distribution. A life tenant has a duty not to harm the future interests of holders. Affirmative waste is defined as any structural change intentionally made to the estate that causes harm to the estate or depletes its resources. A life tenant has a duty not to consume or exploit the natural resources of the land unless one of the following applies. Prior use, reasonable repairs and maintenance, expressly authorized by the grantor, or normal use of the land itself. In this case, Omar conveyed a per otra vie life estate to church and a remainder to all his grandchildren and their heirs and assigns in equal shares. As a life tenant, church has a duty not to exploit the natural resources of the land. Church has clearly breached this duty by, by allowing Darren to regularly remove sand and gravel from the property. However, since the remainder is a vested remainder subject to open, 
The shares of the class members are not yet fixed because Omar could have more grandchildren. As such, Church and Darren should be enjoined from committing more waste and damages should be recovered for the waste that has already occurred since 1975. However, since the class members of the remainder are not yet fixed, they have not yet been determined, these damages should be impounded for future distribution, i.e. when in fact the class actually closes. Let's look at the other three options and see why they'd be incorrect. A. The plaintiff should succeed because the interest of church terminated with the first removal of sand and gravel. That's that's inaccurate. Church continues to have its interest. However, they should, in fact, be enjoined from continuing to engage in waste. So A should be eliminated as an option. C. The injunction should be granted. Yes, that's correct. But damages should be denied. That's where we lose here in option C, because Omar and Carl are not parties to the action. Again, that's not especially relevant. That being said, C is not a correct answer. D, damages should be awarded, but the injunction should be denied. It doesn't make very much sense. If you're granting damages, it's because the other parties are engaged in some sort of behavior that should be stopped. So as a result, they should be enjoined. If there's a granting of any award or any damages, inherently they should be enjoined from continuing to do that behavior. Otherwise, there'll have to be continued suits bought for the continued waste. Question number nine, we're inching up on that finish line. Devlin was the owner of a large subdivision. Parnell became interested in purchasing a lot, but could not decide between lot 40 and lot 41. The price and fair market value of each of those two lots was $5,000. Parnell paid Devlin $5,000, which Devlin accepted, and Devlin delivered to Parnell a deed which was properly executed, complete, and ready for recording in every detail except that the space in the deed for the lot number was left blank. Devlin told Parnell to fill in either lot 40 or lot 41, according to his decision, and then to record the deed. Parnell visited the development the next day and completely changed his mind, selecting lot 25. He filled in lot 25 and duly recorded the deed. The the price of lot 25 and its fair market value was $7,500. Immediately upon learning what Parnell had done, Devlin bought an appropriate action against Parnell to rescind the transaction. If Devlin loses, the most likely basis for the judgment is that A. Devlin's casual business practices created his loss. B. The need for certainty in land title record controls. C. The agency implied to complete the deed cannot be restricted by the oral understanding. Or D. The recording of the deed precludes any questioning of its provisions in its recorded form. Take a few seconds and choose the best answer. The correct answer is option C. The agency implied to complete the deed cannot be restricted by the oral understanding. The deed transfers legal title to some interest in property from the seller to a buyer. A valid deed must be in writing, identify the parties, describe the property, and be signed by a grantor. Authority for a person to fill in blanks left on a deed can be implied from the deed otherwise being properly executed, completed, and delivered to that person. Here the deed Devlin delivered to Parnell was properly executed, complete, and ready for recording in every detail except that the space in the deed number uh, was left blank. Parnell had implied authority to fill in that blank. Although Devlin told Parnell to fill in either lot 40 or lot 41, Parnell filled in lot 25, the most likely basis for Devlin to lose in an action against Parnell to rescind the transaction for filling in the wrong lot number is if Parnell's agency to fill in a lot number could not be restricted by Devlin's instruction to choose either lot 40 or 41. Accordingly, the best answer is option C. Let's take a look at options A, B, and D and see why they would be not as correct option A. Devlin's casual business practices created his loss. Well, it's important to note that yes, 
Uh, there was a hard and fast, loose and fast way of handling business here, but that in and of itself is neither here nor there. Just because there are hard and fast uh, business practices does not necessarily mean they're inaccurate, nor does liability arise as a result. B, the need for certainty in land title records controls. Well, there would have been certainty once the deed is filled in and filed, which it was. It was filled in and filed. So as a result, B would not be applicable. D, the recording of the deed precludes any questioning of its provisions in its recorded form. That is inaccurate if there's a fraud, if there's anything else that's engaged. Simply because something is filed or recorded does not preclude any questions of it. So as a result... We're only left with C as a possible option for an answer here. And question number 10, our last question of this grouping. Devlin was the owner of a large subdivision. Parnell became interested in purchasing a lot, but could not decide between lot 40 and lot 41. The price and fair market value of each of those lots was $5,000. Parnell paid Devlin $5,000, which Devlin accepted, and Devlin delivered to Parnell a deed which was properly executed, complete, and ready for recording, and every detail except that the space in the deed for the lot number was left blank. Devlin told Parnell to fill in either lot 40 or lot 41, according to his decision, and then to record the deed. Parnell visited the development the next day and completely changed his mind, selecting lot number 25. He filled in lot 25 and duly recorded that deed. The price of lot 25 and its fair market value was 7500 Assume the following facts for this question only. Before Devlin had time to learn of Parnell's action, Parnell sold lot 25 to Caruso for $6,000 by a duly and properly executed, delivered, and recorded warranty deed. Caruso knew that Devlin had put a price of $7,500 on lot 25 but he knew no other facts regarding the Devlin-Parnell transaction. Crusoe's attorney accurately reported Parnell's record, record title to be good, marketable, and free of encumbrances. Neither Caruso nor his attorney made any further investigation outside the record. Devlin brought an appropriate action against Caruso to recover title to Lot 25. If Devlin loses, the most likely basis for this judgment would be that... A, the statute of frauds prevents the introduction of any evidence of Devlin's and Parnell's agreement. B, recording of the deed from the Devlin to Parnell precludes any question of its genuineness. C, as between Devlin and a bona fide purchaser, Devlin is estopped. Or D, the clean hands doctrine bars Devlin from relief. Take a few seconds to choose the best answer now. The best answer here is C, as between Devlin and a bona fide purchaser, Devlin is stopped. The recording system only protects bona fide purchasers and mortgagees. A bona fide purchaser is a subsequent purchaser for value without notice at the time of the conveyance. Record notice exists for facts that a reasonable search or public records would reveal. Here, Caruso likely qualifies as a bona fide purchaser because Caruso paid $6,000 for the lot, and Parnell's record title looked good, marketable, and free of encumbrances. The recording system will protect Caruso as a BFP, so Parnell will be a stop from recovering title to lot 25. Therefore, the most likely basis for a judgment against Devlin is that as between Devlin and a bona fide purchaser, Devlin is a stopped. Option A says the statute of frauds prevents the introduction of any evidence of Devlin's and Parnell's agreement. This is inaccurate. The statute of frauds would not stop any evidence from this agreement in being presented. B. Recording of the deed from Devlin to Parnell precludes any question of its genuineness. Again, this is inaccurate. There can be questions of genuineness, especially if there's an allegation or claim of fraud of some kind. D, the clean hands doctrine bars Devlin from relief. 
Uh, the clean hands doctrine is generally thrown in to some of these answers. You can, for the most part, eliminate it right off the bat as this doctrine of clean hands is not something that's generally used or even common. So for the most part, it's thrown in as a red herring. Here, the correct answer is option C. I hope you got that right, and thank you for participating with us. As always, thank you for joining us on Bar 10 Test Prep, where it's our goal to help you prepare for the bar exam 10 questions at a time. Please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell so you can be updated every time we upload new content.